Welcome to ASEAN Beast, your only choice for business updates covering ASEAN countries. I'm Andrew Chia. And I'm Eric Chong. And we bring you business news on everything that happens around the world and how they affect ASEAN. Our Durian main story today is Singapore property in Dundrums. Dodrums. Dodrums, sorry. <laughs> but before that, <laughs> let's look at our current business updates on the topic of latest on Deutsche Bank and Syria. Well, Andrew, what can you tell of our listeners about Deutsche Bank ah, and Syria? Deutsche Bank yeah, seems to be in kind of trouble. Yeah. The share the, price have been coming down quite steeply. Yes, if our listeners remembered, in an earlier edition, we saw that Deutsche Bank is getting into serious trouble with share price down 90% from its high of 140 to $14. Uh, that was our previous edition. Right yeah, now, th- they have dipped below $10. I think that was about a month ago. Sometime back. Sometime yeah. back, right. And uh, right now, things are looking more urgent with uh, another drop to less than $10 and a very heavy fine of $14 billion US dollars imposed by the US due to some subprime fraud transactions earlier. Wow, that's a great sum. And uh, if you think ba- banks are honest. <laughs> 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 and also due to upcoming elections in Germany, a bailout will out of place, and this will make Germany's biggest bank look quite desperate. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, too bad for them. The timing is not them. so good. So timing no good, and uh, I think those politicians will not opt for a bailout for this bank. Yeah, the too big to fail argument. Mm. Right now, there's a new argument called too big to bail out. <laughs> <laughs> so if the bank have not will not be built up by the government. Let's wait and see what will be happening to our uh, people. Right, right now, a lot of people are worried about the repercussions of Deutsche Bank's failure because they are also involved in about $65 trillion worth of derivatives. And uh, we know that $65 trillion is about the size of our whole world's GDP yes. currently. <laughs> can you imagine just one bank alone can cover the whole world's GDP? That's an enormous amount. Mm-hmm. So let's keep a Close watch on Deutsche Bank's developments as we may need to take cover immediately if something bad really happens. So uh-huh. what sort of cover we can take, Andrew? Uh, uh. It has never happened before. Mm-hmm. Perhaps our listeners may be able to suggest to us what kind of cover we can take if something of this kind of uh, size really happens. The only cover I can think of is the reset button, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> we zero rise everything. Probably every country in the world will close its doors and mm. prevent anything bad from coming into their country. So, uh, <laughs> Germany hit the world once at Second World War. Now Germany <laughs> hit the world the third th- the second time in terms of economics. Right. Oh, so uh, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed and put that away for a moment <laughs> and uh, look at Syria. Now, what has Syria got to do with ASEAN and got to do with, with the world? Mm. Um, you see, recently, or rather the past few years, there are a lot of things happen in that part of the world or called the Middle East, like Iraq, Syria, Iran, and places like that. Mm. And the world news have painted that the current president of Syria, Mr. Bashar al-Assad, as the bad guy and the dictator of the country, oppressing its population. And the U.S. have been up supporting the rebels of Syria in trying to topple Mr. Bashar and to bring about more democracy in the country. Right? Yes. So uh, that's all that's an happening for past few years. Mm. Then Russia came into the picture and they say that, oh, Mr. Basha is the officially elected head of the country who should not be toppled. They then went on to support Mr. Basha in defeating the rebels. So you see the two big boys, uh, big tycos in the fighting, world, uh, uh, supporting different sides, different sides of the country. So this will be an interesting uh, turn of event. Let's um, say say uh, Donald Trump wins the per- presidential elections. Probably he will comes into agreement with Russia. Right? Um, I'm a little bit afraid <laughs> of right now, before he even gets elected. Yeah, but right now, the situation is, both the leaders of the world, or the Taikos, are supporting different camps, and they are almost coming to blow with each other. Russia just issued a warning saying they are very angry with the U.S. What is going to happen next? 
they don't want to negotiate or talk to each other anymore. Well, looks uh, like the Cold War has like, started. Yeah, those days we had Cold War where mm. uh, both the US and Russia are very afraid of uh, each actually other. Actually, not in talking terms also. Ah, uh, yes, very cold. Very cold. Cold, war. cold yeah, until it turns ice. <laughs> but the problem is they never fought. Yeah. They they didn't fight with each other, just Cold War. Right now there's no Cold War, but mm. who knows? Who suddenly knows? they might get too angry with each other. Or <laughs> they or they uh defrost the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is... danger comes when you least expect it sometimes. <laughs> it's true, it's true. But uh how does that actually af- affect the ASEAN region? Yeah, right. this will not only affect ASEAN, Eric, it will affect the whole world, right? Yes, yes, because these are the two tycos in the world. Yeah, if US and Russia actually uh, start a fight, mm. we will never know what is going to happen next. Okay. Yes, yes. So we have to keep track of uh, two things now, what is happening in Deutsche Bank and what is happening in Syria. Mm. And uh, we will welcome any suggestion on how to take cover. <laughs> right, and uh, also uh, it will be an interesting turn of event on how should Donald Trump win the election. Yeah, then yes. you need to buy a more nuclear shelter, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> then you'll see that uh, he's actually a Republican and he will off for war. <laughs> okay. Oh, sounds serious already. Sounds serious already. Okay, it's uh, Tuesday morning, so we don't need to paint a very gloomy picture. The world is still very beautiful, right? Yeah, great, folks. Hmm. That's our current business update for today. We'll be back shortly with more interesting updates on ASEAN Beast. Stay tuned. Welcome back, folks. You are listening to ASEAN Beast. Before we bring on our main story for this edition, Eric is going to share with us his funny business moment. And the title of his story is Shredding Machine. A man with a piece of paper in his hand comes into an office where another man is sitting next to a shredding machine. Do you know how to operate these things? He asked. I have an important paper here and I want to make sure this is done right. <clears throat> sure, the other man answered. Just put the paper in here and press this button. The first man does so and saying, Great, now where do the copies come out? <laughs> okay, so can you imagine a, an office worker can't even differentiate a shredding machine and a copier? Hey, nowadays, guys are too smart for their own good. Yeah, they can only differentiate what type of phones they are using. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Eric, for that funny business moment. Guys, you're listening to ASEAN Beast, your only choice for business updates covering ASEAN countries. I'm your host, Andrew Chia, and together with me is Eric Chong. And we bring you all the business news that involves ASEAN countries. The title of our Dure Main story today is Singapore Property in Dundrums. This article is produced courtesy of SAMFIS, the Center for Financial Intelligence Studies. SAMFIS is an international financial research organization based in London, and they do research on all practical aspects of money. We are grateful for their contributions on financial articles so far and hope they will continue to support us in giving us more updates in our money world. Okay, Andrew, what can we talk about Singapore property? To all of us uh, Malaysians, yeah. we felt that Singapore properties is pretty expensive and it can be a very robust market. You know, Eric, some time back, probably, uh, probably one or two years back, there were friends in Singapore asking me um, whether it's good to uh, invest in properties in Malaysia or Kuala Lumpur in particular. Mm. I was telling that lady, uh, Singapore property market may be slowing down or looking quite bad at that time, mm. but... Our country, Malaysia, is not much better. <laughs> yes. And uh, looking at the whole picture, Singaporeans have more purchasing power than Malaysians. And uh, we actually see quite a number of Singaporeans coming over to Malaysia to buy properties, especially in Johor and uh, Malacca. And like most countries in ASEAN and even Asia, Singapore's property prices kept going up especially prior to the subprime crisis in 2008. When the bubble burst in US, Singapore followed suits with the Singapore government initiating many painful but necessary measures to curb property speculation. Yes, Eric. Right. At least the Singapore government is doing something. Right, right now, the Malaysian government is also doing something. Eric. Trying to do something, but uh, whether it works or don't work, we can't say. Sometimes, Eric, I think uh, it's a matter of the timing. 
Mm. You know, some people complain that the government should have done those measures earlier. You know, some mm. say that oh uh, no, the shouldn't the government shouldn't put measures to make the property market so painful. Yes, and uh, you can see that certain countries where the government does not interfere with the property market, it has actually escalated so high yeah, that the yeah. normal people can't even afford. A roof shoot over their head. The roof, right. Shoot through the roof. Uh, one typical example we can see is uh, Hong Kong. Yeah, very expensive. Very expensive. And uh, if Singapore government don't do something about it, the speculations will be very high, and the prices will be beyond reach. Mm. So Singapore has actually is- initiated a lot of cooling measures, which were to ensure that low, non-performing loans and to prevent high leverage for property loans. You know they are. Bre- Borrowing, uh, valuing the property one million ringgit or one million dollars worth of property, mm. they value at one point five. You know? So it's so very there are high. Something extra to renovate your properties. Right. Then when they uh, get bank loans, they are not able to pay back because the installments will be much higher, right? And and if I remembered actually our previous edition, we actually talked about banks, uh, controlling the loans and actually giving out lesser loans. Right, and giving Singapore a lower leverage. Exactly that. Mm. So basically, it's to slow down the lending from the banks, which is the main factor why property prices are high or low. And earlier, Singapore became the most expensive city in the in us Asia to buy a luxury house after Hong Kong. Yes, Hong Kong right. is the most expensive, as you just mentioned. Yes, but and Singapore is not far behind. You know? It's true because both of them, the size is. Yeah, they are also island, they are island countries, nations, island mm. but I believe Hong Kong is slightly bigger than uh, Singapore, right? So that you see the scarcity of properties. That's the measures. Yeah. So with all these cooling measures, what happens now is Singapore's house prices slide by the most in more than ten, uh, seven years. So you can see there's a very drastic uh, mm. down slide of prices. So with this, do you think it's time for Singaporeans to buy more ha- properties? Uh, um, because the price is dropping. <laughs> yes, the problem is, Eric, like we mentioned so many times before, yes. people like to buy when the price is the highest. Yes, they want and to they chase. don't like to buy when it's low. When it's low, they are too pessimistic. Yeah. So the head of Singapore Central Bank, Mr. Ravi Menon, said last month that the city-state doesn't plan to ease property curbs anytime soon. Even as home prices have fallen 11% from a peak in uh, 2013, September, and right now, sales have halved. Oh, that's very powerful. Wow, that's powerful. The sales have halved and uh, the central bank head says that um, they don't plan to ease the curbs anytime soon. Mm. And everybody in Singapore, I believe, is expecting the bank, uh, central bank to ease it and to reduce the suffering. Okay? Yes, and I believe that this situation is quite similar to Malaysia or especially KL. You can see that nowadays there's uh, actually an uh, increase in supply of condominiums. Right. We even have a high supply of uh, shopping malls, yeah. which actually most of the malls are quite empty. Mm. So you can see, Eric, uh, if shopping malls are empty, mm. the uh, shoppers or the buyers, they are not so, uh, they are not suffering so much. But uh, if residential houses like condos or terrace houses, uh, you cannot afford to buy, then probably the buyers will be suffering. And uh, talking about shopping malls, yesterday I went to one shopping mall in Sri Tamansara, newly opened. You can see that the whole shopping mall, there's only two tenants. Serious? Yeah, <laughs> two shops open, but they are pretty huge. Mm. Just that it's occupied both uh, main... Half the half complex. The sh- complex, mm. which makes it uh, very dangerous because the shopping mall is so dependent on these two tenants. And mm. you can see one is quite a prominent tenant. They already put up the sign there, clearance sales already. Wow, <laughs> okay. you open shop and you have clearance sales already. Yeah, can you imagine if Does these that shops... Does give you any confidence? Yes, if these shops cannot survive, what will happen to this shopping mall? It's down to only one tenant. Whoa, that sounds serious, right? And I think this will uh, happen typically in a lot of new malls because we don't see much of shoppers actually shopping yeah, now. Yeah, and actually we have mentioned this numerous times mm. before. That there are too many shopping malls in uh, Klang Valley in Malaysia. Mm. Definitely, some have to give way. And probably our listener can make a wild guess. How many shopping malls are there in KL alone? KL uh, or yeah. Klang Valley? Uh, more than 100. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you divide the population into rations. 
and you can see how many shopping malls to the population. So I believe, Eric, uh, in Malaysia as well as Singapore, the developers are the ones that are suffering the most. Okay, and uh, they have to offer discounts and payment programs and a lot of other incentives to stop their sales of all the properties. Yes, and they will uh, have a numerous launching. They will uh, have special so launching. Then they can call a relaunching, all sorts of launching that you can name it. And right now we are seeing so many people, uh, so many developers selling their properties in shopping malls, mm, uh, yes. whereby such things are uh, never happened. Never before. happens before because those days selling properties is quite a glamorous event. Yeah, and uh, Eric, do you notice that people are selling properties now on Facebook? Yeah, it's true. Yes, people just shop on Facebook. Um, <laughs> I mean, not the um uh, the single unit houses or what. Uh, they the actually developers. selling the whole project, whole project on Facebook. On Facebook, and very aggressively. <laughs> so I think it shows how desperate they are, yeah. both the Malaysians and the Singaporeans. Because if I'm not mistaken, any projects that have been approved, is uh, there's a time sensitivity to the approval. And if they don't kick off the project, the approval might need to be revoked. Hmm. Sounds right. serious already. Sounds serious. Right. We will take a break and be back with our stories shortly. So stay tuned, guys. Welcome back. You're listening to ASEAN Beast and our Durian main story today is Singapore Property in Doldrums. But before we continue with the concluding part of our story today, Eric will give us a quick health tip and his story for today is Eating Smart for the Race Day. Thanks, Andrew. We are reaching towards the end year end and there are numerous races to participate. And very often, most runners will be uptight on the days before race day. Here are tips on how to eat smart for race day. Many runners make the mistake of topping off their glycogen stores by feasting on cups in the form of a spaghetti dinner the night before a race. But flooding your system with more cups than it can process may lead to digestive problems that will make have you running to the toilet every mile. Consume moderate quantities of cups for several days prior to your race and spread your consumption throughout each day. Have oatmeal for breakfast, potatoes for lunch, and a small pasta dinner. Mm-hmm. Right, Hungry already. So what we, I'm talking here is the race. We have numerous running events every weekend. Right? And mm-hmm. towards the year end, there's more events coming up. Mm, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. It's fun to join all this race, but uh, runners got to be aware of their own body systems on how to eat, especially right. for long distances. Yes. Thank you, Eric. That's a great health tip. Let's continue with our Duran main story today, that is Singapore property in doldrums. Right. Before the break, we actually talked about the developers are desperate as those in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. We have seen earlier that developers in Malaysia are so desperate right now They have used every tricks in their bags. Initially, we talked about offering discounts, throwing in freebies, such as the legal fees and stamping, air conditioners, free car parks, free maintenance, free kitchen, well, anything you can think of. (laughs) (laughs) They even offer installment on the 10% deposit upon signing of the SMP agreement. Well, that shows how desperate because uh, when construction is in progress, the funds is keep on going yeah, because out. the banks are not lending. So some buyers are having problem with their 10% deposit, mm. which can work out to quite a bit of money. And they have not only offered to reduce, uh, to give installments for this deposit, they have even offered to waive the deposit. Yes. You don't have 10%, Eric. Doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Do you have 1%? Yes. It I'll just... give you a discount on that 9%. On the 9%. Wow. This happens to a lot of developers. And uh, such an attractive offer actually generated quite a lot of sales. It's generated a lot of sales, but finally, with no loans from the bank's forthcoming, they even offer to lend to the buyers directly. But it seems that this latest te- tactic has not picked up stream yet. Because it's quite difficult for the developer to finance their own construction project as well yeah. as to finance the buyer. They themselves are actually cash tight. Mm-hmm. So unless we difficult. can see that those very big developers or smaller size project, but nowadays in KL you hardly see any small size mm-hmm. project. Everybody so, is talking about mega projects. Right. <laughs> right now it's quite interesting, and <laughs> uh, we are waiting to see what innovative measures 
Singapore developers can come up with. Perhaps our Malaysian developers can copy some tricks from them. Possible, uh, because we also can see that some of the Singapore developers are actually having some development project in Malaysia as well. Mm -hmm. Right, and similarly, probably there are some Malaysian developers having some projects in Singapore, and uh, Singapore and Malaysia actually the culture is quite similar. So probably the you one practice the other also the same, right? So and uh, right now Singapore investor should make more money and accumulate more capital and buy when the price become very attractive and hopefully, the banks will relax. Their lending guidelines and the property market will shoot up again as before. Does that give you any confidence? Yes. Mm. So does the common people like to see that when they see the property market shoots up again? Yeah, I believe uh, all the people in the world, in many parts of the world, like this kind of yo-yo feeling, very <laughs> high up and very low down. Yeah, you know? it, it so gives a very high feeling. Uh, the adrenaline keeps pumping. So pumping. it's no fun if the government regulate, like in some countries in Europe. They mm. say that okay, the properties in this area is fixed and the eight percent appreciation each year. Mm. So where's the fun? No fun. You know, it's fixed because to <laughs> a lot of uh, governments, I mean, in uh, certain countries, to them, properties are just a dwelling units. It's not as a here uh, is a gambling unit. It's, it's not a so-called speculative items. It should be just a dwelling units for people to stay. That's all. Yeah, right. the problem with this part of the world, people like to speculate and uh, bet mm. and uh, On they get anything. Very excited and, <laughs> and they, they get, get very, a very high high adrenaline rush, <laughs> you know. Uh, my bet is uh, turn out to be correct. The property prices have shut up. So mm. they're very happy. They're happy. They sell, they make a lot of money, go to the restaurants, they yes. have a feast, you know. And then they buy a luxury car here and there. Uh, uh, yeah, after that, uh, it, it just drop down sharply the prices uh, then they sell their car then they stop patronizing <laughs> those uh, big you know, fat a lot fine of fun dining. over this part of the world <laughs> <laughs> so it's make your life more interesting <laughs> mm. so Eric for those who have invested earlier what happens um, well, you have you would have no choice if you have uh, bought properties then the price have dropped down and then your rental have uh, gone down and you may not be able to service your bank installments so mm. what can you do I yeah. think you would have no choice but to ride out the storm and later become a wiser investor in future. Yes, that's true because uh, if you're still ho holding on to the properties, practically you can't cash out mm. or you wouldn't want to cash out. Yeah, and if you want to cash out, the prices are too low. Too low. So, so you, you if you wouldn't want to cash, cash out, make sure you have sufficient funds to hold on yeah, to it. Like they say, you and the ride bite out the, the storm. bullet. Bite the bullet, ride out the storms, tighten your belt. So it's time for a good weight loss program. <laughs> so what advice can we give to future investors or even current investors? How well, to know when the market is too high or too low? One or two tips can we give to them? Yes, probably we should also pay attention to the figure or ratio of household debts to GDP ratio because the governments will use this benchmark to make decisions whether to encourage or discourage banks on lending to customers. A ratio of 60% is ideal, but not practical in most countries. And a ratio approaching 100% would definitely signal interventions from the government and the entire central bank. Mm -hmm. right. so guys, in this case, this uh, I believe that most countries are already approaching 100%. Uh, we wouldn't say most. Maybe we say many. La. Many, la. Yeah. okay, right. You know, Eric, a lot of people out in the streets there, they are totally clueless. Uh, particularly the property agents who are just selling properties for their companies, for their clients, for the owners, you know. Mm -hmm. So they keep telling me that, uh, you know, why is the government going to implement uh, curbing measures and all that to cool down the market? It is not doing any good for the economy because it will collapse the economy. The banks are not making money. If they don't lend the property, how can they uh, make mm -hmm. money, right? So their logic is that just uh, to the make property money. market will not crash and the government will not institute any cooling measures because it will bring the market down and it is not in the interest of any party when the market is bad. Yes. So their conclusion is that uh, their uh, career in the property line is always secure. always secure. They can always sell properties. The property yes. prices will keep going up to and, no end. And they always perceive that, of course, as you mentioned earlier, the property prices will never come down. It will keep on going up. Right. 
it's true in a sense, but then the, if you look back towards uh, certain properties, because it's the time frame and the time period. Yes. You know, and the cost of construction is different. Yeah, you see this, for example, these property agents, if they don't understand this ratio called the household debt to GDP, then they cannot understand why uh, property prices will come down, you know, mm. and the uh, government will have cooling measures. Because in the first place, they don't know what is this ratio all about. Yeah, and... You know, uh, if they can understand, then they know that, okay, government will definitely do some measures to cool the market. Because if it keeps going up, the people will not be able to pay their installments and the economy will actually crash. Yes, that's true. And uh, we actually see that a lot of young property agents keep on buying properties for themselves as well. Mm -hmm. Because they thought that, uh, well, uh, this this uh, one, two years, I make a lot of com commissions. So it's time for me to buy more properties. Well, so I, as time goes by, these property agents are uh, become quite uh, victims, victims of the market. Of the market because of ignorance. Yeah, due to this ignorance of this simple ratio, finally they will have to come to the fact they can do all the self denial because the developers will help them with the denial uh, attitude. Definitely, the developers. Because the developers will, will tell them no, the property prices are not coming down. You see, yes. probably it's coming down for the commercial sector. We are in the residential, residential sector, sector. It's still okay. We are doing condominiums. The demand ah, will still be okay. Yes. You know, even in the residential sector, there are so many, you know, mm. property prices for $500,000 properties and below, they are not affected. Mm. Those higher ones will be affected. This area is not affected. That area is affected. So the young property agent becomes very confused. Confused. And he conveniently believes that he still has got a job to do and right. he still can make money in the market. Okay? And... So, uh, just put it a second thought. Do you really need to buy a house to stay in? Why don't you offer rental? Right? So that's also another thought because uh, most of the people, especially young people, just not stay put in one place. So see, you... that will happen when the property market becomes uh, too hot. Too hot. When yeah. people think that it's so expensive, why not I rent? I or rent rather, first. I have no choice. I can't afford the deposit. I can't ah. afford the installment. I can afford to rent. Yes, because yeah. the renter definitely is much lower than your monthly instrument. So mm -hmm. in this situation, I believe that uh, most of the youngsters will offer for renter first, mm -hmm. see for themselves how their career path move in three to five years, then only they decide. Right. So in these situations, I believe that most developers are quite desperate to actually rope in all these young people to buy their properties. That's why you see that they are throwing so many freebies. And you mm -hmm. see that nowadays the condominiums design actually gears towards a lifestyle rather yeah. than a gear towards the property. Soho and all that. Right? Right. So it's all targeted to the younger people, the yuppies. Mm. Because the developers knows that the older generations got no more hope already. Older generations will not buy more properties. May or may not. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in the end, when the government steps in or the central bank steps in to say, okay, uh, the property market is too hot, Okay, let's cool it down a bit. Ask the banks to slow down or stop lending. Mm -hmm. Then everything will come crashing down. And yeah. the, for example, property agents, they are forced to accept the fact mm -hmm. that property prices actually can come down. And it has come down across the board. Not only uh, commercial or agricultural properties or whatnot, but all the properties in whichever area, the prices have come down. Yes, and I believe in KL, actually, the prices already hit up too high already. Hmm. Right, that's my personal opinion. I can't say uh, about others. You know, to a lot of people, they felt that it's still cheap because they are still earning good money. Hmm. Right. As long as you earn good money, it's cheap, lah. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So, so that's great. Um, guys, we have come to the end of our show today. We hope you have enjoyed, and we'll be back with a brand new Duran main story for our next edition on ASEAN Beast soon. Thank, Thank you, you and, and goodbye. goodbye.